current limiters. Um, this is not an easy technique, but it's a very exciting technology. Growing power demand, increasing interconnection of the power systems, and increasing connection of the decentralized generation leads to increasing short circuit currents. The blackout on 14 of August 2003 caused the loss of 30 million dollars per hour. This could be easily prevented if the superconducting fault current limiter would be used. The resistive and inductive fault current limiters require much the same characteristics from the material. You can regard the inductive fault current limiter as a one-turn transformer. This essentially puts the single turn in series with the uh, supply and so it behaves in exactly the same way as the resistive fault current limiter. Because of this transformer action, the superconductor in the inductive limiter has a lot of amps and very few volts, whereas in the resistive one it's got fewer amps and lots and lots of volts. The disadvantage of the inductive limiter is the large amounts of iron and the very awkward nature of the um, cylindrical inductor. The advantage is that there are no current contacts to it, which would call, which cause losses in the uh, resistive limiter, and also that hot spots in a cylinder are bypassed by the rest of the cylinder, whereas resistive fault current limiters are very vulnerable to hot spots. This is just a model to uh, show the usefulness and working principle. We have a uh, IPCO bar coated with uh, silver in the uh, liquid nitrogen bar. Down here is our power supply. So the uh, IPCO is always perfectly cooled. If uh, the switch is open, the current will flow through the uh, superconductor. And I can show that. And uh, after that here through the small wire. And now the uh, current, if I switch it on, push the trigger, you see that the uh, Upco bar became normal conducting and that way the uh, nitrogen started boiling. But if I close this switch here, the fault current limiter won't be in the circuit anymore, only the small fuse. And you can actually see the big difference. What we have to do is to try to analyze the quench in a uh, resistive and indeed inductive fault current limiter. And this is not easy because it goes through a region where it's impossible to measure the properties. We're going above the critical current where it gets very hot very quickly. So there's no way that we can measure the VI characteristics in this regime. This diagram shows the sort of curves which are quite plausible. There are a series of voltage current characteristics of gradually increasing temperatures. And the superconductor must always be at some point on one of these curves according to the temperature. However, it must also be consistent with the supply voltage and the resistances in the circuit, and that gives us a load line, and the intersection between the load line and the curves is where the superconductor must be. So we start off not on the load line because it's superconducting. As soon as the, um, we get a short circuit and a fault, we go up the VI characteristic until we reach the load line. At that point, it's going to be heating up very rapidly, so it moves back along the load line, along the curves of gradually increasing temperature until it reaches the normal state. It may, of course, go higher, but the resistance won't change so much after that. So once it reaches the normal state, the current below that is the current at which it stabilizes. But for the recovery time, that is very important for a real application, you need that the heat that is already deposited in the conductor must be removed as fast as possible use of the bulk materials as a re uh, resistive for current limiters, we realized that actually uh, we could reach better results if we decrease the uh, temperature separation from the working temperature to the TC. Because actually if you have a very big separation, you have very high current, but also the inhomogeneities of your material can be very big. And it's very difficult if you prepare a resistive fault current limiter to have a series of bars which are all of them homogeneous. Why not to decrease the TC by deoxygenating the sample? If you 
put out the oxygen in your material and you decrease the TC, but you increase as well the normal state resistivity a lot, mainly if your AV planes are not oriented along the bar. If you have the component of the uh, current going along the C-axis of the YVCO structure, then the normal state resistivity increases a lot. We were able to generate electric fields as high as 4,800 volts meter with this one single bar. You can incorporate this uh, kind of materials either in a resistive four coron limiter or in a hybrid four coron limiter. You have very high current, but also the inhomogeneities of your material can be very big. You can have what we call the hot spot in one point of your material, completely different than the other one. And the final result is that you generate a lot of energy in this hot spot and you burn your material. But if the processing parameters are well controlled and the rigorous testing is conducted for the components and the system, the first commercial installations at the medium voltage level can be achieved. The application of three-phase superconducting fault current limiter at high voltage level seems very attractive because at this voltage level there is no conventional counterpart to superconducting fault current limiter and considerable saving can be expected. The 10 MV amp superconducting fault current limiter is a joint effort of many companies and research institutes. The usual synthfin based fault current limiter which is usually a meander like this. Now, when there is a short circuit, only this part of the meander will switch at the beginning of the short circuit, which means that all the power will be concentrated in this part of the wafer. And also means that only this line is working as a full current limiter. Those lines are not working as a full current limiter. Synfin based full current limiter on a two inch wafer, a constriction along the meander, and this constriction are here in order to uh, better distribute the power during a short circuit. And this increases the performance of a synfin based full current limiter. At the beginning of the short circuit, only this part of the line will switch. Only this, 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 this. And in this case, all the, all the line will contribute to the limiting current. And we can distribute all the power in all the, uh, over the whole wafer. So this is the, one of the prototypes we, we build for, for testing this new design. So in this prototype, you can see here the current is coming here and it goes like this. And we put here all the voltage to measure each line of the meander in order to see the behavior during the short circuit. And in this new design, what we did, we just split this constriction in two. And when you split the constriction in two, you do a, it's like you do a hole in the, the meander. So the current is flowing like this. And in this case, it's flowing like this. There's a thermal effect. And then here there is a propagation of a, of a thermal front. There is two front of propagation, and in this case there is four front of propagation. So in this case, the temperature of the line is lower than in this case. We are, we are studying here two inch wafer, but we can buy uh, up to eight inch wafer. So for a real fault current limiter, there will be uh, 10 or 20 of these eight, uh, eight uh, inch wafer in series or in parallel. The idea of introducing constrictions along the thin film meanders to initiate the resistive transition in a whole wafer was successfully implemented into the coated conductor technology. Continuous layer of the thin film coated conductor was perforated to provide constrictions for the transport fault current. Here is a demonstration of the 6 millisecond quench propagation of short constricted coated conductor sample. The individual frames represent images captured at the particular moment of the quench development. The blue line represents resistance of the element. Uh, the most dramatic moment uh, is when the tape is switching the first time, when the first hotspot develops, because then all the current is diverted from the superconductor into a short segment of tape and that's a large change in the current pattern. Resistive is faster 
then the, the, the inductive one, when you increase the power, you have to increase the volume. So the volume becomes very big. And this is faster, and the, the short circuit current is slower. Inductive superconducting fourth column telemeters doesn't need the current leads to the superconducting elements, and they are simpler in structure than the resistive one. There are two types of superconducting fourth column telemeters one with the closed core and another one with an open core. The inductive superconducting fault current limiters with closed core consists of the iron core and the Cooper primary winding. Inside the limiter is a ceramic superconducting tube which acts as a secondary winding and is situated inside the limiter. Despite the fact that the potential hotspots are easily bypassed in superconducting cylinder of inductive fault current limiter, it is possible that the mechanical stress induced during fault may cause the fracture, breaking the continuity of superconducting cylinder. The other type of superconducting fault current limiters is a limiter with open core, which is simpler to service and simple in structure. This is the primary Cooper widening. The secondary superconducting winding and the iron core. The voltage current characteristics of this type of limiter is not as good as this limiter with closed core. The efficiency of the limiter with open core will never be the same as a limiter with closed core. <laughs>